everyone, I'm Catherine Spann, although I like Katharina much better. I'm going to start going by that. Um, I'm a research scientist at the University of Texas at Arlington um, with Link Research Lab. And the work I'm presenting today is in collaboration with James Schaefer, a graduate research assistant with Link, and Dr. George Siemens. So I approach the topic of self-regulation um, through a psychological perspective, and um, this is where I view self-regulation as a broad construct that encompasses the full range of ways in which human beings adjust their behavior. And so although self-regulation, like we've talked about um, multiple times today, it's contextual, it is relatively stable across the lifespan, meaning that those um, with low self-regulation during childhood relative to their peers will grow into adulthood um, showing lower self-regulation relative to people their age. Um, and it's largely predictive of a number of important outcomes, uh, such as SAT scores. Um, the, it predicts if you're going to graduate college by the age of 25. It predicts other things like physical health and mental health, and as well as um, the possibility of criminal convictions. So I view self-regulation through this psychobiological model of self-regulation. And this was put forth by uh, Dr. Clancy Blair. And um, what this model um, suggests is it really addresses how the ability to reflect on information and direct behavior through intentional, goal-directed, top-down control through those executive functioning processes, how those processes interact with and depend on these bottom-up physiological um, uh, physiological responses to stress. So what this model puts forth is that at sort of the, very, the very bottom level, this um, at the genetic um, level, we see that there are individual differences in genes that code for certain receptors um, for catecholamines and glucocorticoid activity that has um, an effect on stress response physiology, including the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, which then goes forth to influence our emotional reactivity to and our emotional regulation, um, which of course influences our ability to pay attention and um, to have executive control. And, and then importantly, these um, top-down processes of executive functioning and attention feed back down um, towards the regulation of emotion and the regulation of stress response physiology, which then ultimately goes back and, and modifies our, um, our genes. So at this top level um, where of executive functioning and of, of attention, um, I'll talk about from the psychological perspective, where researchers generally characterize EF as a specific set of attention regulation skills involved in conscious, goal-directed problem solving. And although this uh, specific relation, the relationship between executive functioning skills and self-regulated learning as we talk about it here, it really remains to be unexplored, but I view it as really synonymous, um, and especially with its emphasis on goal setting, self-monitoring, and strategy use. I'll, I'll talk about how I'm assessing that differently, but I do view the, these constructs as highly overlapping. And so with executive functioning, um, there are these three sort of core skills that are involved listed, so working memory, inhibitory control, and cognitive flexibility are these sort of agreed upon core skills that are involved in executive functioning. And one way that um, executive functioning is measured is through um, a task called the dimensional change card sort task. And I'm gonna describe this here because this is the task that we used in this study to, um, to measure executive functioning. And basically what we have here is that participants are presented with a set of stimuli um, where they learn 
two rules. Uh, really, one rule is to match by color and one rule is to match by shape. So they're presented with shapes in various, in either, um, in one or two colors, and they're um, repeatedly told to match on color, match on color, match on color, and then the rule will, will switch and will say match on shape. So you can see that this sort of task is um, tapping into all three of those core executive functioning skills. So you need the working memory to remember what the rules are of the game. You need inhibitory control to um, override an impulse to choose one shape or the other. And then the cognitive flexibility to go back and forth between the rules. And so you can see that this performance, it greatly depends on the prefrontal cortex, um, which is heavily involved in self-regulatory abilities. So then on the other, um, on more of the bottom-up processes, we have stress response, physiology, and emotional reactivity. And um, the way in which these can be measured are through the techniques um, provided by psychophysiology as well as affective computing, which those two terms are um, largely synonymous. And so psychophysiology involves the use of physiological signals to understand psychological processes. And one goal of psychophysiology is to investigate the, the physiological processes by which emotion is embodied. So emotions, we know we feel them, but they also manifest within the body itself. And we can um, place various sensors on the body to get at these um, psychological processes. Two common uh, psychophysiological measurements that I've um, heard today that we'll talk about in, in this study are heart rate and heart rate variability. So it really rests on the idea of psychophysiology, which the brain and body are intimately connected. And um, heart rate is different from heart rate variability. So, um, and they manifest through the two different nervous systems of the body. So we have the central nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord, and then we have our peripheral nervous system, um, of which the autonomic nervous system is, is a part of that. And the autonomic ner nervous system is also divided into the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. So we have the sympathetic nervous system, which you might be familiar with, that's you know getting your body uh, ready for engaging in a task, it's focusing attention, you'll see an elevated heart rate, and so on. A, a signal with the electrodermal measurement, that's sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system is sort of the rest and digest. So um, the system that sort of brings your body back down and um, sort of lets you rest. And importantly, those two nervous systems work uh, together. So they're antagonistic and they work together to bring your body into a self-regulated state. Um, so the one nerve that's really important for heart rate variability in particular is this, uh, what's called the vagus nerve, which directly connects your brain to your heart and is um, controlling your, um, your heart rate on a millisecond time scale. And so importantly, these two are related really through this, um, what they call the central autonomic network of the brain. It involves um, various brain um, regions that um, directly control the heart and control, um, control behavior. And there is evidence that heart rate variability at rest predicts self-regulatory abilities. Um, this is really what drove my research here. And um, one thing that I was really interested in was um, how if measured, if heart rate variability is measured during a task, um, how do these two sort of play out? So the current study um, here is we measured um, a number of different indicators of self-regulation at a local museum. So we had participants that were museum visitors eight years of age and older. And we took multiple measures. We had the executive functioning measure, which I described earlier as the dimensional change card sort task. We also had a measure of um, a self-reported measure of arousal. 
which was the self, um, self-assessment mannequin. So basically, participants would just look at this and rate how they're feeling their energy levels um, from low to high, and um, I'll call this self-reported arousal throughout the presentation. Lastly, we had them wear an Empatica E4 wristband, which um, was the wristband used, um, described earlier um, in the keynote. And so this wristband, it's a clinical grade device um, that allows us to assess all raw data. And it measures both heart rate as well as heart rate variability through a PPG sensor. The sample here, we, I had um, over 200 individuals, um, 228, um, about 43% males, the, a wide age range, so I had a minimum age of eight, a maximum of 69, and um, I had a relatively diverse sample, about 20% Hispanic or Latino, um, and then you can see the racial makeup there. So to the results, I, um, this is basically just looking at heart rate and heart rate variability. So we had a three minute rest period for the participants so we could measure baseline levels of these physiological measures. And if you look on the left side, this is um, results from heart rate. So we have, um, you can see at baseline, that's that lower um, brown bar. Um, it was heart rate was significantly lower than um, during the executive functioning task. And on the right side, you can see heart rate variability. There was no difference um, in uh, heart rate variability at rest or during the task. And that increase in heart rate is expected when you're engaged in a cognitive activity, you expect heart rate to increase. This is just to say that age is highly correlated with physiological measures. So both um, heart rate and heart rate variability decrease as you age. And I did have, like you saw, a wide age range. So I get um, to really see the full spectrum of how these change over age. Um, the, so the basic relationships here, um, first of all, you'll see that the first top left, heart rate and heart rate variability, those two are highly correlated, but in the opposite direction, which is expected because we have those two nervous systems at play. We have this sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Um, so they're highly negatively correlated. That second row of self-reported arousal, you'll see that what I report feeling, how I report my energy levels is positively, re positively related to my heart rate, but it's not related to heart rate variability. That third row, we have um, how these three relate to the executive functioning performance. Um, so you see heart rate was not related. There was just no relationship. And then heart rate variability was positively um, relate, moderately related to executive functioning. And then the same is true for self-reported arousal. And importantly, this relationship between self-reported arousal as an executive functioning was a um, nonlinear relationship. So you can see here that um, low and high arousal levels respectively were associated with low performance. If you're at that sort of average level of arousal, that middle um, person, if you're uh, reporting on the self-assessment mannequin, um, that's associated with the highest performance. For the main results, um, I had, we did multiple regression analyses. The outcome was executive functioning. You can see here that um, age and heart rate were included to control for these. Um, other relationships and heart rate variability emerged as the strongest predictor, um, accounting for about 5% of the variance in executive functioning skills. Self-reported arousal was also a significant predictor. And then importantly, the, that last term was an interaction term put into the model because it was really clear to me that age was um, having an impact on the relationship between heart rate variability and executive functioning. And what this interaction looks like is this. So um, what this is showing is the relationship between heart rate variability and executive functioning skills. And you'll see um, there's a moderate relationship overall, 
between heart rate variability and ex executive functioning. But as you age, as you get older, this relationship attenuates. Um, and it's basically just flipped. So you'll see at age 39, um, that relationship is no longer significant. Um, in this sample, age 28, it was, still, it was still significant. So that relationship between heart rate variability and executive functioning. This was not a main goal of this research, but um, and it really isn't clear what this means, but um, age was having a significant impact on my results, so um, I'm reporting this. Summary, so this is the, really the first study to examine heart rate variability during an executive functioning task. What this study shows is that heart rate and heart rate variability are different. Um, heart rate variability predicts, predicts executive functioning skills and heart rate does not. Um, heart rate variability is a stronger predictor of performance than self-reported arousal. Implications of this are that, um, first, heart rate variability is an indicator of self-regulation. Um, I think it complements existing approaches, but it doesn't replace existing methods. Um, so we can consider the cost and sort of the ease of measurement that goes along with measuring. But I do think it provides um, a, an important and reliable signal for self-regulation. Um, wearable technology in general, it can offer us a non-invasive sort of passive measurement approach rather than having individuals self-report, which are largely, um, you know, subject to the individual bias and so on, um, we can have this sort of non-invasive passive measurement. Age is an important factor, just to reiterate. Um, one idea is that we could possibly adjust our um, schedules based on self-regulatory patterns. So if we can map these, um, these signals out over time, perhaps we could adjust um, our schedules to, um, to meet us at our sort of prime self-regulatory abilities. Um, lastly, I'll just say that um, one really strong implication for me is that heart rate variability um, we know that it can be increased. So there are certain activities um, such as deep reflective practices and meditation that have been shown to greatly increase executive or greatly increase heart rate variability. So if we can increase heart rate variability, perhaps we can increase self-regulation. Thank you. And we have some time for questions, so please. <laughs> uh, I want to test my understanding. Uh, heart rate variability would, in a sense, test the sensitivity of the uh, parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems to make adjustments to stimuli that are being processed. And so is, is this re relationship between heart rate variability and uh, executive functioning uh, reflecting that sensitivity, or am I misunderstanding HRV? Um, so heart rate variability is really an indicator of the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, so it's on, it can be measured on that millisecond time scale. And um, the only thing that can have an influence on that, um, that time level is um, the parasympathetic nervous system, which is measured through heart rate variability. So um, not necessarily sensitivity per se, but it really is a strong indicator of our ability to rest and calm down. So bring our body um, down to a certain set point of self-regulation, not necessarily the sympathetic and parasympathetic working in tandem. Does that make sense? Thanks, Phil. I'm glad to know these work. I wasn't brave enough in our session this morning to try them out. So um, can you go back to your correlation outcome slide? So I'm going to ask a, no, that's the one, um, a, a kind of naive and perhaps practical question. I'm looking at these numbers and I'm, I'm so impressed at, well, our, our keynote this morning about the instrumentation and the level of detail. But a lot of people are not going to be able to do what what Sana has done or what you've done. And here you're seeing that self-reported arousal is 
less than heart rate variability, but how much less? You're going from 0.84 to 0.73 on the effect size. Mm -hmm. So realistically, from in your opinion, is self-reported arousal, you know, a pretty darn good measure mm -hmm. for people who can't instrument a whole lab with a put slap sensors on everybody, and you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's a great question. Um, I will say that heart rate variability and self-reported arousal aren't correlated. So those aren't, I don't think that they're measuring the same thing. Um, so they're sort of different constructs, really. I don't think that one could be replaced um, with the other. And like I said, I'm not suggesting that you know, these physiological signals can replace self-report or self-report in general, um, but I think that they add an additional layer. Um, so it's an important question. I think there needs to be more research to say, are there other proxies that we can use that we maybe don't need these physiological indicators? And that may be the case, but the research has to be done to show that. Um. I'm just wondering, did the, um, the subjects, did they have access to the biological feedback? I mean, were they able to then maybe learn about themselves and kind of a biofeedback right. way over time and then report that somehow? Or yeah. So in this experiment, no, they didn't. Um, but these devices do have real-time feedback. So um, it is possible in the future to sh sort of show the participant or um, the student their you know, particular levels and, and they may adjust over time, but not in this study. All the way in the back. Great, thanks very much. That was really interesting. I'm fascinated by the finding that you had where the effect seemed to fade with age. I think it's the next slide after this one. I thought that was really an interesting thing to find uh, and it's one of the, I can imagine all sorts of reasons why that might be, but I wondered if you had any mm -hmm. ideas about Yes. What's going on there? Yeah, so um, like I said, this was not the main purpose of this study, but it was very clear that age was having an impact. Um, the reading that I've, I've done, I've found one um, description by um, Cacioppo, who's a big uh, physiological researcher, and he's uh, there was a couple statements in one paper that said, may, uh, that suggested that these autonomic nervous system indicators so for example heart rate variability are not as strong in older individuals that they simply just attenuate with age um, that's one explanation that doesn't fully explain the heart rate variability ef relationship but i think i think that might be it and i did have a very you know my my age sample went to 69 so i, I am going at sort of you know, much older ages than are typical in a, in a university setting. So um, that may be one that our signal, we just don't, as we age, the signals don't emerge as strongly. Can I uh, ask one uh, question about that though? Because you had the executive functioning test, but was that the same for all participants? So did the eight-year-olds do exactly the same test as the oldest participant? Yeah, so they did exactly the same test and it is, um, it has been tested both reliable and valid for all, across all ages. Um, the executive functioning measure, you know, we know that self-regulation increases with age, but those scores, every score that I presented here, the executive functioning measure has been corrected for age. So it's norm to the specific um, age range and that's provided um, through the NIH tools. Enormous. Thanks. Phil? First of all, everything attenuates with age. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm speaking from personal experience. Uh, I'm wondering now that I understand HRV, whether you might speculate about whether if instead of using a measure of EF that was a composite of its three main components, if you segregated those and particularly about inhibitory control and mm -hmm. relationships. So is your question, do I think that they would correlate the same way? Or potentially, for instance, is working memory irrelevant? Is inhibitory control uh, reflective or predictive? Um, with the signals, particularly? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not understanding. I'm wondering, you used a composite measure of EF mm -hmm. that puts together all of these three components. I'm wondering if you might improve your prediction, okay. increase the size by mm -hmm. disaggregating that. Uh, perhaps I'm 
trying to think of executive functioning tasks that would um, isolate the, the three components, um, but that's certainly something that could be could be tested in the future. Well, I mean, so, some of the there are some various measures that particularly were designed to measure inhibitory control mm -hmm. that might segregate that from the other elements. Right. I, I think that's an important point. The DCCS is a very broad executive functioning measure that includes all of executive control. I think if I did isolate just inhibitory control, I might have a stronger relationship. Uh, if you ever to actually took a computer test, you might be able to take it out because there's mm -hmm. response times and uh, actual actions. So you might actually separate the two. Mm -hmm. but it's on there. Last question. So I thought there was one more question over there. Just briefly, I'm wondering uh, what was the uh, R squared for the regression model? How much of executive function could you actually for explain? The, the full model, of course, they don't have it here, um, but I believe it was around 10%. I could get that to you. Okay. If there are no more questions, thank you. Thank you.